So I would like to start uh, by quoting one of my professors uh, from my BFA days. <laughs> and what she once said that art is the nucleus of humanity. And the more I practice, the more I, I make art and live within the art world, the more I agree with her. Um, her name was Simone Michelin, and a very dear professor of mine, and a mentor as well. You know, a turning point um, or uh, iconic moment in, in my life was when I saw two art shows that my father took me to see. One of them was Luciano Fabro, which is from the Arte Povera traditional tradition, from the Italian kind of historical um, scenario, but working with contemporary um, medias and and with a very different discourse. Um, so it really impressed me. I think one of the pieces that most impressed me, and the first time that I ever came across the the myth of Sisyphus, the you know rolling up the rock always starting from zero was in this show where he had this piece which was a big cylinder of marble um, and it had a big uh, this drawing very beautiful like renaissance style drawing on the marble um, engraved in the marble and a big pile of of cacao powder in cocoa powder in the front and as he rolled this cylinder over the powder, it left an imprint of Sisyphus. So it was this beautiful piece about how poetic and, and amazing the process of being an artist is. And also another show that I saw with Bispo do Rosario, which is a Brazilian artist, he was committed for most of his life and made these beautiful embroidered pieces and he had a very um, <sighs> convoluted kind of style of work with um, lots of religious, um, let's say, references, archetypes, all sorts of like amazing things. And I was very impressed. I remember thinking, well, if somebody in the state of utter confusion can produce something this beautiful and eloquent, then wow, art is a fantastic thing. It's truly a universal language. and. I, I want to kind of speak that language and learn it. So I guess I re that was a, a turning point where I was like, oh yes, okay, this is what I want to do. And I decided to enroll in, in the art program in Rio. And then I started in the UFRJ, which is the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. It is a huge modernist um, complex built in the 50s. Um, during the military dictatorship, and it was quite an experience. Um, I had never uh, been exposed um, to such raw realities. Rio is a very big city, and it is very poor. There's a lot of inequality. In order to get to the university, I had to go through, like, or at least see, not literally go through it, but be very near a very, very big slum. Um, which is always a, a reality check and being like, oh yeah, this is, my reality is, is very small compared to the world. After that, um, while I was finishing up, I I started working with Ernesto Neto, which was a big influence and still is, and is a mentor, a friend. Um, and he's a very established artist internationally. Um, he makes beautiful fabric sculptures. I remember that at the time I was, when I met him, I was still in school, he went to do a talk at, at my class and I was just starting to work with fabric. And he saw what I was making, and I saw what he was making. I didn't know his work, and I was really fascinated by it. And as he was leaving, I asked him, do you need an assistant? And he said, yeah, <laughs> come by. And I'm like, all right. And basically, that's how I became his assistant, which was really, really, I'd say, work of chance and like a meeting that was very fortunate. 
After being a practicing artist, I decided at some point that I needed to pursue my own practice and then I stopped working in art in a studio for a bit um, to just immerse myself in my own practice and I did that for about six years. I was a practicing artist in Rio and did that exclusively, worked teaching and did private lessons, worked with a youth program, coordinated and, and mentored a lot of, of public school art teachers in Brazil work with children, at-risk children, which is something I think is very satisfying, um, very fulfilling, I'd say, um, to, to give opportunity and to be at, in places where, where, where there is need for art and creativity, where that truly creates perspective for, for the community that you're working with. Um, but I think that art it's necessary anywhere. It doesn't matter if, if you know, if you're in need. Sometimes you're wealthy and you still can benefit so much from from being creative and learn so much from from diving into a creative practice. Aside from being an artist, I always have I always have had a curatorial practice, and in, in Rio, I did have a a group that I created that I founded, Group Pi, <laughs> as in the Greek letter, um, and the idea was to catalyze and, and bring together all these different artists. It began with people that were still at school because when I started this group, I was almost graduating, was in my last year um, for, before uh, graduating with my BFA. But that was very important. We were all very young and we wanted opportunities to show our work. And, you know, it's a very competitive world. It's very hard to show your work. So we felt that by collaborating, we could have better chances at, at just having a shot at, you know, putting our wor work out in the world. So that's exactly what we did. We just found spaces that we could occupy, like four houses under construction that were from one of the people that was involved in the group at the time. Um, and we just went there, made an exhibit, and that's it. It's, it's basically as simple as that. And we kept going, and then we decided that we were doing this in Niteroi, which is a little further from Rio. and, and it, between Rio and Niteroi, there's the Guanabara Bay, which is a huge bay, huge, huge mass of water. So how do we cross it? So we decided to make a show in a ferry boat, <laughs> literally crossing the bay with the art show. And we got 70 artists in this ferry boat. It was a lot of fun. It was very exciting. It was very, um, very uncommon. Everybody was kind of shocked and surprised and excited at the same time. Um, and, you know, these experiences, I think they're important for the moment that I am right now, that I'm, I'm here in Boston. I feel like it's time to, to kind of try to have the same kind of community building. I'm always interested in, in finding artists that have the same kind of restless energy and want to get together and, and you know, have shows, pop-up shows or not, and, and just basically aggregate and be gregarious and productive. Productive is a good word. Kind of confronted with the question of, okay, so I've shown in museums, I've did this, I've did that. What is miss? There's something missing. What is it? And I figured that it would be studying and continuing my education and being back in, into the academic world. Then I decided to pursue an MFA and because I had been living in Brazil and in Rio for so many years at that point in my life, I decided that it might be a good idea to go elsewhere, maybe revisit the place where I was born. So I ended up coming to the United States, <laughs> to Boston. 
I was accepted to SMFA and and it was really a wonderful experience. Um, there were three difficult years. I think a, a master's is always a hard um, place, a, a hard experience for anybody and, and for an artist as well, especially if you already had your practice and kind of developed your language. Um, you are confronted with your own work and kind of like what can you do with that how can you develop it um where are the weaknesses the strengths so it was a very very good moment to reflect on that and i think the result i'm still working with the with everything that i gained from those three years met wonderful people my advisor mark cooper very supportive always, Magda Compass Ponds, which I TA'd for, and then, you know, still have a very good relationship with. Um, and all the, some MFA artists that, you know, some, many moved away and some are still here, uh, that I still keep in touch and still work with, um, and would like to work with and, you know, all those things.